Good day. As I am making this video, there are reports again of a very big Russian missile strike on Ukraine. Missiles apparently um, landing in all parts of Ukraine, launched from Russia. Most of them airborne missiles, uh, but no doubt there's also shipborne and land-based missiles involved as well. As is my invariable practice, I will wait a couple of hours uh, to see exactly how big this missile strike is, how much damage it's doing, what its effect is, before I comment on it in further detail. What I would say is that in the hours just before this missile strike took place, Ukraine seems to have made some kind of an attempt to disrupt it. There were reports of drone attacks on two of the big bases of the Russian um, strategic forces, strategic air forces, in Engels and in Ryazan. And um, it's difficult again to get a clear picture of what these attacks involved. There's some, some reports that the attack on Engels managed to do some damage to two Tupel F-95 bombers. I don't know how extensive that damage is, but the nature of Tupel F-95 bombers, bombers that were designed in the Soviet Union in the early 1950s, but which are still workable, workable fully workable machines, rather like the American B-52 bombers of the same era. Anyway, the nature of these bombers is that they can be repaired fairly quickly. Components are not difficult or in short supply. And these are reasonably simple, by today's standards, bombers to repair. The most complex part of these bombers, other than obviously the electronics, which can certainly be replaced, are the engines, these giant Kuznetsov engines developed in the Soviet Union back in the early 1950s. But as I understand it, these engines are still in production. They're the biggest turboprop engines built by any country by far. They've never been surpassed in scale. The Russians still build them. And so if there was damage to the engines, that can presumably be repaired also fairly soon. So I doubt the damage to two Tupel F bombers, Tupel F-95 bombers, is going to do much harm. About the strike on Ryazan, I have no information at all. It may be that it was more effective or less, but I can't say one way or the other. All I would say is that if Ukraine did launch this attack in order to try to disrupt the Russian missile attack that we are seeing at the moment, then the fact that that missile attack is taking place argues against it having been especially effective. Though again, I will have to see and review the scale of that attack in full before I arrive at a final view about this. And also, um, it would suggest, as I said, that Ukrainian attacks apparently carried out by drones on these air bases are more pinpricks than anything else. I would say something further, though, about these two attacks, which is that, once again, um, highlighting something which we saw after the Ukrainian drone attack on the Russian air base in Crimea back in August, there does seem to be problems with the security of big Russian air bases. And in Crimea, that problem seems to have been sorted, but it seems that there are still problems in some of the bases, the big bases, that the Russians have on their own territory. Clearly, they don't expect attacks on those bases, and these Ukrainian attacks would have told them otherwise. And I would add that the Russians, for the moment, seem to be more worried about the attack on Engels. That's the one where the two Tupel F-95 bombers are said to have been damaged than, on the, than the attack on Ryazan. Um, Ryazan, a drone, could in theory reach the um, Ryazan base if it was launched from Ukraine itself. A, an attack on Engels, 
would require a drone to move an enormous distance. I've seen some su suggest that it'd be a, something like a thousand kilometers from Ukraine before it were able to reach Ryazan. And that would clearly imply, oh sorry, Engels, and that would clearly imply um, a significant technological development if it was indeed launched from Ukraine. But the suspicion in Russia is that this particular drone was launched from within Russia itself and was controlled by Ukrainian agents operating there, which is obviously a very alarming fact, a matter of great concern for the Russian security services. And it's been pointed out that millions of refugees from Ukraine have arrived in Russia over the last several years since the conflict began in 2014. Some of them are likely to be Ukrainian agents. And it's also been pointed out that Natalia Volk, the assassin, as is widely believed, of uh, uh, Daria Dugina, the daughter of the Russian um, intellectual and philosopher Alexander Dugin, uh, who was killed, murdered also again some weeks ago, um, this person had apparently very little difficulty getting into Russia, despite the fact that she was not only Ukrainian, but had public connections with the Azov regi Regiment and with the Ukrainian security services. So there's been a lot of talk about the fact that the Russians need to tighten up their security, need to keep more careful track of the people from Ukraine who are entering their country. I have to say, though, and this is a point which is borne out by Russian reports of other incidents when Ukraine has tried to launch sabotage attacks. The Russians call them terrorist attacks, but I'm going to call them sabotage attacks on Russian territory, that um, up to this point, there's been several instances when people who are identified as Russian citizens have also been involved in these attacks. There are some people in Russia who are Russian citizens, some of them ethnic Russians, who for whatever reason are prepared to cooperate and work with the Ukrainian security services in carrying out operations of this kind. Now, whilst I'm on this track, I should say that over the last couple of weeks, the Russian counterintelligence and counterterrorist agency, the FSB, the organization which I believe um, still um, operates from the Lubyanka building in Moscow, the former headquarters of the KGB. But again, I'm not absolutely sure about that. But anyway, the FSB, the organization which in the West is often spoken about as the KGB's successor, though there are in fact various other agencies which could also claim that title for themselves. Anyway, the FSB, together with the Rosgvardia organization, that's to say the uh, military units, mili military style units that are in charge of internal security within Russia itself. Anyway, the FSB and the Rosgvardia have carried out a major drive over the last couple of weeks in the Donbass to break Ukrainian intelligence um, networks that have been established there ever since the conflict began back in 2014. Um, a, a networks established by the Ukrainian intelligence service, the SBU. And it seems that large numbers of people have been rounded up and have been subjected to presumably the usual practices of interrogation and all of this. And the Russians, for the first time, seem reasonably confident that they've got on top of the long-standing problem of SBU, Ukrainian infiltration of Donbass. And I suspect that something on perhaps a more diffuse scale, 
is going to happen in Russia too before long, once the FSB and the Roskvadia organization um, refocus on that. Anyway, these are developing stories. The missile strike on Ukraine, which as I said looks like a big one, and the previous Ukraine drone strike on the Russian bases. These are developing stories and I'm going to have to touch on them in more detail in my next video when hopefully we'll have, well, I, I presume we will have much more information about both. Meanwhile, the situation on the front lines continues in the, along the same lines as before. There's been exceptionally heavy fighting around Bakhmut City. Um, there's more information, by the way, that a um, Ukrainian, um, that, that another Ukrainian, that another settlement near Bakhmut has now been captured by the Russians. I'm not entirely sure of its name, but it seems that the Russians have indeed captured more territory close to Bakhmut. And it seems that they're now very close to um, clearing Marinka and Vodiane, two uh, settlements, a town and a village near Donetsk, both of which are said to have considerable military significance. So clearly mo a lot of fighting is going on there. And there are reports also that Ukraine is suffering casualties in the fighting or in and around Bakhmut at a rate of five to 800 people dead and wounded every single day. Now, if it's 800 on a ratio of four to one, which somebody told me was the correct ratio between numbers of dead and number of wounded, for every dead soldier, there's usually four wounded. Well, if it's 800 um, wounded, if it's 800 dead and wounded on any particular day, that would suggest around 200 Ukrainian soldiers killed, and perhaps a bit less. And if it's 500, it would suggest around 100 Ukrainian soldiers killed everywhere, every day. Now that's in Bakhmut alone. There have been lots of Ukrainian attacks in other places, Ukrainian counterattacks, all of which are being repelled and it seems that the Russians are gradually, ever so gradually, uh, moving ever closer to places like Kupiansk in Kharkov region, that they're gradually extending their areas of control, building incrementally these fortified lines that we're hearing about. And by the way, it's confirmed that that's largely been done by civilian contractors under contract from Russia's defense ministry. And reporters who've been there speak of these fortifications as being extremely impressive and built to a very high standard. Well, I wouldn't know one way or another. There's also been a very interesting report, by the way, which I cannot confirm again, but whose content would not in any way surprise me. In fact, it corresponds with things that I've said in the past that this disastrous practice that Ukraine's military has been following over the last few months, ever since it tried to go on the offensive at the end of August, of sending small groups of troops forward in penny packets, only to have them, in most cases, annihilated by the Russian forces that this is a product of Western training, that Western militaries, Western infantry tactics over the last 20 plus years have in effect focused very much on small units, very small units, as part, in, if you like, of the counterinsurgency wars that the United States and its allies, primarily Britain, have fought in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere. And it's been pointed out that whilst that kind of tactic might be appropriate in these sort of wars against um, the kind of 
insurgencies that the Western powers had to fight in these places, that it is simply not appropriate for the kind of war that has been fought in Ukraine today. And there's also been reports, by the way, that the Russians have given up the idea of fighting in small units themselves. They used to fight in battalion level units, which are, by the way, significantly larger than these penny packet platoon and company level attacks that Ukraine has been engaging in, but that the Russians have basically put aside the idea that battalion tactical groups are the way in which to conduct wars. And they're now reverting to their historic practice of operating in much larger formations, regiment and division level. And that could again be a reflection of Surovikin's thinking and that it, this is apparently a better style, a better way of operating forces in this conflict. Well, I'm not going to discuss any of that in more detail. Military tactics at that level is absolutely not my area of expertise. I may be completely wrong. It may be that the people who are reporting these things are also completely wrong. But it was an interesting article in itself, and I pass it on. What I did find much more interesting, however, was comments from a senior um, official of the Raytheon Corporation in the United States. And um, this person, I think he might even have been the CEO, has ad admitted that in 10 months of war, Ukraine has run through 13 years of production of Stinger missiles. And apparently with javelins, it's more like five years, but it's also pretty grim. And he made it very, very clear that it is going to take a very long time before production can be cranked back up to the level of replacing all of these systems. And I should say that I received, again, one of these enormously interesting and helpful private emails that I get from time to time from all sorts of members of our community, uh, the Duran community. This person who describes himself as an old engineer, in other words, I suspect a veteran uh, and a person who was involved in engineering, he's discussed the current Western industrial structure in great detail. He's pointed out how starting from the 1970s, it increasingly adapt, adapt, adopted Japanese management techniques just in time and all of those things, that it basically operates on the basis of um, production organized, uh, carried, performed by a very small cadre of very highly skilled per, um, personnel based, in, based upon just-in-time deliveries of spares, most of which, many of which, of course, come from abroad, including from places like China. And he said that this is completely different from the what he describes as the self-contained, autarkic, mass production, Fordist industrial systems, which carried the West, especially the United States, through the Second World War, which persist in Russia and which are to be found in some other places, China, I suppose, but which simply don't exist in the West any longer. And he, this person pointed out, and I'm, I have no doubt that he's absolutely right about this, that the idea that the West can rebuild its industrial structure rebuild its industrial output of weapon systems to the kind of levels that it once was able to churn out, you know, up to the sort of 1970s, is entirely unrealistic. It would require a massive change, not just in industrial systems, but in whole systems of industrial organization, a complete reconstruction, if you like, 
of the entire industrial base of the West, not just physically, but also conceptually as well. And this person says, and I'm no doubt at all that he's right, that that simply isn't going to happen, that it simply isn't realistic. And that, by the way, flows also from another piece which I read uh, by, I think, a gentleman called David LaSalle. I often read him. He writes a lot on energy matters. And um, LaSalle was talking about the oil price cap idea, the, which, by the way, um, is supposed to be entering force very soon. Today, December the 5th, for those who don't know, is the day when uh, the European Union stops directly importing oil by sea from Russia. It can still buy oil from Russia, but it has to, from this point on, do so through middlemen, through Chinese and Indian middlemen. And at the same time, it's trying to impose this worldwide cap ceiling of $60 on the price of Russian oil, which happens to be roughly the price at which Russian oil anyway trades. The Russians, by the way, have made it very clear that they're not prepared to work with this oil price cap. And the Russian energy minister, Mr. Novak, today spoke about the possibility of a slight cut in production because the <coughs> um, import ban that the European Union has imposed upon itself means that there's less likely to be a demand for Russian oil in Europe. Anyway, LaSalle makes two points. Firstly, he says that this oil price cap is going to achieve two things. Firstly, it's going to provide China, the world's biggest manufacturing power, and the West's major economic and industrial and trading competitor, with an energy subsidy, because it means that the cost of producing goods in Europe is now going to be higher, because energy costs in Europe are now structurally higher than they would otherwise be, that we've discussed many times, but that since the Chinese can now buy their oil from the Russians at a discount, which they will be able from this point forward to do indefinitely, that means that they now have a situation where they can, they have an energy subsidy in effect for their industrial machine. And it'll be an even bigger energy subsidy than the United States gets in terms of its own self sufficiency in oil and gas. And of course, this comes, and this is a point which LaSalle also makes from the fact this, that what follows from this also is that this energy subsidy which the Chinese are getting is going to grow in importance over the next couple of years because as a result of the various, shall we call them, environmental policies, I have to always be careful with my choice of words here, that Western governments are pursuing, there is increasing signs, well, there is increasing signs of major cutbacks by energy companies in investment in fossil fuel production, which means that within about, within a few years, five at the most, there is likely to be a significant oil shortage. Now, if that is right, the Chinese will continue to get their oil at a low price or a lower price from the Russians, whereas oil prices in the West, including in the United States, will spiral. And LaSalle makes a third point, one which I will admit I understand rather less, but he clearly seems, knows what he's talking about. He also points out that the $60 a barrel price that the Europeans are imposing, as they think, on internationally traded Russian oil, 
is now in effect the actual base it's the it's the low point the low point below which it's now difficult to see oil trading now i'm not sure that this is exactly correct now i don't understand the mechanics of this it's something that i'd have to look into and read through rather more carefully but i wonder whether he might be right there in other words that what the European Union has just done, what the G7 have just done, by point imposing this oil, this price cap on Russian oil, what they've actually done is that they put a floor <laughs> under oil prices as opposed to a ceiling above them. And, of course, they've given an energy subsidy, an indefinite energy subsidy to China, and they've ensured that prices of energy in the West and in Europe are going to remain high for the indefinite future. And because of the lack of investment in the fossil fuel energy in industries, that price is simply going to grow. Well, I, 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 it's, it was all from him, not from me. I think it, it all sounds right to me. I'm not going to say much more about it. Anyway, yesterday I was discussing the fact that Western leaders, perhaps because they're aware of the fact that the situation in Ukraine is not going Ukraine's way, despite all the claims that they're making, perhaps because they can see the problems in the energy system um, in Europe especially are intensifying. And by the way, the weather is now very cold, or getting much colder in Europe. And we're also seeing the windmills not turning because there is insufficient wind. And so presumably gas is being taken out of the underground gas reserves at a higher or high rate. Again, we don't have much information about any of this. But anyway, um, because of all of that, the Europeans are now talking again about some kind of peace settlement. And the person who's been most busy, as I've been discussing all this, is Olaf Scholz. He's now written another piece in which he says that there must be no return to the Cold War. <laughs> now, I find that a bizarre argument to make, given that the um, situation is much worse in terms of international tensions than I remember it in any period of the Cold War that I lived through. I, I lived through the Cold War in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. I remember that there were some tense times in the early 1980s, though nothing on the scale of what we're seeing at the moment. Um, and I have to say, for a lot of the rest of the time, as I recall, relations, for example, between the superpowers and East and Western Europe in the early 1970s and late 1960s was actually, if anything, pretty good. Nothing like the bitterness and anger and all of that that we see today. So for Schultz to say that there must be no return to the Cold War, no return to a world in which countries get divided into blocks, that we must all be pragmatic and all of the rest. Well, no doubt it's intended perhaps to try to educate people like Baerbock and uh, Habeck within his own government and people in Germany and Europe. But it does make me wonder, again, what planet exactly Scholz is on. If he really wanted to avoid a Cold War type situ scenario emerging, well, he's acted far too late. It's now upon him. Anyway, he's also talked about the fact that if, if the Russians impose their terms on Ukraine, then the sanctions will stay. So he seems to accept the possibility that the Russians may impose their set, uh, terms on Ukraine. His threat seems to be not that um, 
Ukraine will win the war. He doesn't seem to think that any longer, but he's just trying to warn the Russians that if they carry on the way they're doing, then the West will continue its sanctions indefinitely. And he said that the sanctions are getting more effective week by week. Provides no evidence of this. I would say, on the contrary, that if we're talking about Russia, they're getting less effective week by week. As I've said already, industrial production in Russia seems to have um, recovered. Inflation is falling. Consumer, um, <coughs> consumer um, demand is rising. The ruble has been slightly adjusted down by about one cent, by the way, um, to make up for the European oil ban. But overall, <laughs> it's getting less effective. Remarkably, even John Bolton, the American arch neocon and Donald Trump's former national security advisor, seems to be admitting as much. I've read um, a piece which says that he's written somewhere, Bolton has written somewhere, an article saying that sanctions are not effective as they should be, that we need to set up in the United States another strategic command to examine and look at sanctions in order to make them more effective. He's talking about militarizing sanctions. So he's not saying that because sanctions fail, this instrument should be abandoned. He says, this is a typical neocon position, that sanctions should be made even more intense. But can I just say, of course, <laughs> he doesn't explain how that can be done. It's as a very typical of neocon thinking. You never retreat, you never backtrack, you never apologize, you never admit you've made a mistake. All you do is you say, well, if it didn't work, then we should do it, but do it even more. But anyway, Bolton clearly doesn't think sanctions are working. Schultz likes to tell us that they're getting more effective every week. I don't think anybody believes that. But anyway, that's what he's saying. So he tells us that there has to be some kind of a resolution. We have to avoid a Cold War. Macron has now come out and said that there's no military solution to the Ukrainian conflict. So Ukrainian victory is not going to happen. That's what that seems to mean. They used to say the same, by the way. The West always used to say the same about the Russian uh, war, the war the Russians had to fight in the Caucasus in the 1990s and 2000s against the jihadi insurgencies there. They said that there was no military solution to that war. Russia would never achieve victory, that the only thing that the Russians could should, could do and what they should do was to negotiate with the jihadis, concede uh, independent Chechnya and all that kind of thing. And the Russians paid no attention. And of course, there was a military solution and the Russians won. But I remember that narrative being promoted then. And this is again the same narrative that Macron is coming up with now. But anyway, that's what Macron is saying. No military solution. There has to be a diplomatic one. Yesterday or the day before, he was talking about the need to provide Russia with security guarantees. So they're trying to find some kind of, so it seems to me, trying to interest the Russians in negotiations. But they're not having much success. So we have, we've had comments now from people like Peskov. And um, this is what Peskov said, is reported to have said today. And this is from the Russian news agency, the official Russian news agency, CAS. Uh, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov told journalists on Monday that the Kremlin does not see any shifts in European policy directed at a diplomatic settlement in Ukraine. No, we don't think so, the Kremlin official said, replying to a question as to whether you, Moscow thought there were any shifts in the European stance toward the diplomatic settlement of the Ukrainian conflict. And we, Tass then goes on to report, 
French President Macron, in an interview with the TF1 TV channel following his US visit, said that the future European security architecture should include guarantees for Russia. In his opinion, this issue will be part of peace discussions, so it is necessary to think how France and the EU can protect their allies and at the same time provide Russia with security guarantees once the parties return to the negotiating table. Again, just to repeat again, what Macron is saying is self contradictory. You can't provide guarantees to some states against Russia and at the same time provide guarantees to Russia. That is a contradiction in terms. You're treating Russia in part as an enemy and at the same time you're saying that you're going to provide it with some kind of guarantees for its security. That circle can't be squared. Um, anyway, not to persist with that. And then Taras also noted that Macron emphasized that he did not see any military resolution of the Ukrainian conflict and asserted that the only way to resolve the issue is through negotiations. Well, which negotiations? Negotiations about what with whom? I'm not going to go into that, but the point is Peskov indicates that the Russians are not impressed by all these clever, interesting statements and articles that are coming from Macron and Scholz. Unless Macron and Scholz come with genuine, concrete offers that they're prepared to make public and which answer Russia's actual concerns, then the Russians are simply not interested. And Scholz can write articles about the need to avoid another Cold War. Macron can give these interesting interviews to French television. They can do this sort of thing as much as they like, but it carries no traction in Moscow. Anyway, that's where we are on the negotiating track. Nowhere, <laughs> in other words. I think that Western leaders, again, remain trapped inside their own rhetoric bubble. They can't break away from the strong positions, the excessively strong positions they took last year when they rejected the Russian proposals. They rejected outright the Russian proposals um, for uh, security, a new security architecture for Europe. And for commitments that NATO would not be further extended. They rejected all of that. They took an excessively strong position at the start of the Ukrainian conflict. They imposed all these enormous sanctions on the Russians, and now they're trapped inside that. They're trapped inside their own rhetoric and within their own rhetorical positions. The war will continue, and the Russians will continue with their military campaign grinding Ukraine down. Now, there's been a lot more about, as I said, the state of the military campaign from the Russians. As I said, they've spoken about the fact that they're making um, further gains. And this is now an official, official accounts of the way in which the conflict is going. Um, but there's been this rather disturbing piece from TASS, also from TASS, this time about the fighting in and around Bakhmut. Now, please remember that the Russians refer to this place as Artyomovsk. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that name correctly, by the way. But anyway, that's how the Russians refer to this place. And there's been a interview with TASS by Vitaly Kiselyov, who is, as I understand it, the interior minister of the Lugansk People's Republics, Republic. And Kiselyov is reported to have said the following. The Ukrainian armed forces suffer heavy manpower losses in battles with Russian servicemen in the Artyomovsk direction, but promptly make them up. Vitaly Kiselyov, an aide to the interior minister, he's not the interior minister, an aide to the interior minister of the Lugansk People's Republic, told TASS on Monday. Today, 
In the Artyomov's direction, Ukrainian troops are suffering heavy losses in manpower and equipment. The saddest thing is that despite all the losses, which even Western experts estimated five to 800 people a day, they quickly make up for them, thus not showing inside in the country what is actually happening in this direction. Um, according to Kiselyov, Russian forces are not trying to storm the Ukrainian troops stationed in Artyomovsk in order to minimize losses in their ranks. Ukrainians are dying very quickly in the territory of Donbass. They come here already not only from central Ukraine but from the western regions. This shows how precisely our troops carry out very important tasks, repelling the enemy, destroying. This is mainly thanks to the work of our air force and of course we cannot fail to mention the artillery which during the special military operation has learned to knock out the enemy almost as precisely. In other words, what Kisilyov is describing is the tactic discussed by Surovikin and Prigozhin of grinding the Ukrainians down. No frontal attacks, drawing Ukrainian forces further into fire bags. That was General Wesley Clark's description. It was also, by the way, previously what Marinus, that Marine officer, that U.S. Marine Corps officer, said in the U.S. Marine Corps journal about what the Russians do, drawing the Ukrainians into fire bags, inflicting appalling casualties upon them, allowing the Ukrainians to send more and more troops into these fire bags, and creating more and more of these casualties. And yesterday, there were further reports that a whole unit of Georgian soldiers, Georgian volunteer soldiers fighting um, with the Ukrainians near Bakhmut had been surrounded. And many of them had been killed. I'm not exactly familiar with all the details of that incident, but it was an interesting one because it was confirmed by Ukrainian sources. And of course, it corresponds with all the information we're getting about what is going on all the time in and around Bakhmut. Eventually, the Russians will take this place. Other Ukrainian, uh, Russian officials, officials more senior than Kiselyov, have predicted it will fall this month, that the Ukrainian positions are becoming m ever more complicated and difficult to defend, that Ukrainian losses are simply rising. Uh, but Ukraine is losing five to eight hundred in dead and wounded every day in Bakhmut alone. If we add all together what is going on on all the other fronts, well, it doesn't really bear thinking about. But we're probably easily back to that 1,000 a day which Ukraine admitted it was losing at the time of the Severodonetsk Lizichansk battles. 1,000 killed a day. Um, that was happening at the time of the Severodonets Lizichan's back battles back in the summer. So that is where we are. This time, however, with a Ukrainian army that has peaked in size, with all the dif difficulties in re-equipment, which we've discussed many times on these programs and which Brian Boletic discusses on the new Atlas and which the Chief Executive Officer of Raython has just admitted to all of these problems. And inevitably, this scale of losses is going to have an impact eventually on Ukraine's ability to conduct this war. I'm not even going to touch on further the effect of the continuing damage on Ukraine's infrastructure, the attacks, the strikes, the missile strikes that are ongoing even as I make this video. I will finish further with, with this other thing. I've discussed at various times the potential for Russian missile strikes on the Ukrainian bridges across the Dnieper. Now, just before I started making this video, I saw what looked like a message on a Ukrainian channel that Tupolev 22M3 bombers had been detected um, flying presumably over Russia, 
preparing to launch these giant KH-22 or 32 uh, missiles and these huge anti-ship missiles which the Russians have and which they developed in order to destroy US Navy carriers. Now, this report may be true or it may not be true. I mean, this is a confused situation. Quite possibly it's wrong. But I would repeat again, this capability exists. The Russians do have it. If the Russians launch these giant missiles against the bridges, if they combine that with an attack with hypersonic missiles, such as they also have, and which they're known to have in Belarus, then the effects, I think, on the bridges would be devastating, despite what people despite the many claims we've seen which have alleged otherwise. Many of these hypersonic missiles are now based in Belarus. And President Lukashenko of Belarus recently gave an interview in which he said that with more and more Russian forces now being deployed in Belarus, the Russian and Belarus militaries have to all intents and purposes merged. Well, again, I don't know what the implications of all that are, but it sounds ominous to me, or at least if I was a Ukrainian, I would find it ominous. Well, there we go. That's where we are today. Tomorrow, as I said, I will discuss the current missile strikes, give you all my view about them. I'll also look perhaps at what further information we have about those Ukrainian drone attacks on those Russian air bases. But as I've discussed many times, the direction of travel is very clear. And if Scholz and Macron and people like him are serious about seeking a diplomatic solution, they not only need to start speaking in clearer and simpler language, but they need to face realities and start making more concrete proposals which they can put on the table. Thank you for joining me again today. Uh, remember, you can find all our videos on our other platforms, Locals, Rumble, um, Odyssey, uh, Rockfin, <laughs> uh, BitChute, Telegram, and of course you can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video, and by going to our shop uh, and buying the amazing things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, and all those great things. Lastly, if you've liked this video, please remember to press the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today, and more from me soon.